Hey -o. Welcome back to New Comic Book Day Book Club. We are here as we usually almost are. Except for last week when I blew it. Well, not your fault. Um, we have definitely done over 100 episodes by now, but some of them have been special episodes. So I think this is number 97 for our regular format. If my thumbnail numbering is correct. So, but we I, I really have not cared enough to number accurately. Yeah, I mean, I don't really care that much either. So, <laughs> we're not going to do anything special for 100 because who knows how many episodes we've actually done. But we are here today uh, talking about Batman Black and White number two, uh, which I made Alec get because he had you haven't even done that in volume one, right? No. So when you asked me if I was interested in doing that this this week, um, you know, we looked at the list and there wasn't really anything we were too especially excited about. Um, and I, the only reason I didn't buy number one because you know it is definitely the sort of comic I'm interested in is because I was just going to wait and buy a trade. But because of the fact that, um, despite John's two Instagram posts worth of books he bought this week. There wasn't too much that was uh, we were excited about talking about on the show. So, not particularly like not a lot of number ones, not a lot of indie starter books. Yeah, even though there were a bunch of future state books that I just do not care about at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely gave this one a shot and I did not love it as much as I liked. I liked the Wonder Woman the issue that we did for book club better than this. So that's as if that's a sign. Yeah, and, and I kind of dumped on that, and I think you did too. Uh, we got a couple people in the chat so far. We got PJ King and Todd Christian, who are both tailgating. What's up, everybody? And uh, Bearded Comic Bro, bro our good buddy, who's been on here a couple times with us. What's up, fellas? Um, so if for those of you who aren't familiar with the Black, Batman Black and White series, this is something that DC did years ago for a while. Um, where basically creators just have free reign to write Batman related universe stories in black and white. They're short six to eight pages a piece and um, they're not really continuity. So you can just kind of tell the story you want. Absolutely. Um, and so they decided to relaunch it. Uh, and this is the second issue that's come out since the relaunch. Uh, Ruben Guzman, what's up? Kachoon, welcome, welcome. So it goes to show what little I know, because I did not know that this is the second volume of this. Yeah. Uh, and the reason we can easily review a random issue of this is because they are, each issue is new artists doing their stories. So yeah, the anthology style allows for you to dive in at any point to enjoy it. If you, if you notice particular artists working on an issue, you can say, Oh, like, I, the reason I bought volume one, I saw Trad Moore's name and I wanted to see Trad Moore's Batman. And I, yeah. that was it. That, that was enough to cover the, was it four ninety nine five nine five ninety nine Yeah. I was like, that would cover, like Trad Moore, Batman. I don't need anything else. That's, take my money. Uh, yeah. And, you know, each issue has, I mean, this one has uh, Mitch Gerards and Tom King, uh, David Aha or Aja, I still don't know really how to pronounce the name. Yep. Yeah, uh, Sophie, so, Campbell. So, Sophie Campbell, who does Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Um, right? That's. Yeah. Not, yeah. Um, so, you know, some cool people who do good work. Uh, but it is kind of a bit strange to, talking about it on Book Club because of just how the format is. So I, I mean, I feel like we just should take them story by story and dissect That's them one exactly by one. How, yeah, I totally imagined us doing that in the sense that like you're going to have stories that you love and it speak to you, the art, the story connect and others that you're like, I don't know that I get that. And so that's the, it's the curse and blessing of anthology style. And um, I will say volume one hit a lot more than it missed. So I, I was instantly, I instantly felt like Okay, I'm in for this. I'm I'm ready for more. Oh yeah, PJ King says the G Willow Wilson Killer Croc story in Batman Black and White one was excellent. That's a great one for sure. 
And I, I, I enjoyed the Tradmore one that I mentioned. And yeah, it, it was I it, I liked volume one enough to say I'm going to get the rest of this uh, saga. Or I, I don't know how many volumes or how many issues they're going to do. So first, I want to just touch on the covers really quickly. I got the Jock cover. Um, Which is a beauty, yeah. And you got uh, a Catwoman cover by an artist I'm not familiar with. I but. can't remember who did the variant. Um Doug Braithwaite? Is that who it is? No, it's I got a K and a C. I don't know. It's not this um it's not the Kaome Sirath Mahama. No, I don't know. The only variants listed are Doug Braithwaite and Kaome. And I don't know. That's the signature is right above my finger there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a mystery. Sorry. Uh, the reason I chose this one, the Catwoman one was cool. The third one, I forget what it even looked like, but um, I I had a kind of analogy that I thought of the reason why. Uh, I just really like, I mean, no surprise since I'm such a big Mignola fan, I like bold contrast. You're right. Minimalist. And, and that cover and the, the third cover, which is even more extreme, is just like, especially from a distance, just look gray. Hmm. And I think that's a reason why I'm not the biggest Alex Ross fan, too, is because a lot of his stuff is just so similar, similarly tonal. Like if you look at a page of Marvels, it's just like. Uh, you shout, I mean. Spoiler for me, I mean, I, the timeless variants are mostly garbage, in my opinion. I mean, he's very talented and has done some exceptional work in his time, but uh, I'm just... I mean, I, 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 inversely, I'll say his Immortal Hulk stuff is some of the best I think he's done. Yeah, I agree. But I, uh, for me, it was all about the... Uh, yeah, the, I mean, it's, that's super cool illustration. And, yeah. the booty, and the booty shot here. Yeah, what a surprise. It's all working. All what working. a surprise. Uh, okay, so let's dive in. The, yeah, the, the, I would love to. I mean, we can go front to back, or we can skip around if you want. If you want to dive to one story first, because you particularly loved or loathed it, um, I don't mind uh, jumping around. Yeah, it kind of it kind of went up and down for me, so I'm fine sure. going front to back. Okay, so the first story is the Mitch Jared's Tom King story, and I will say. Um, it is perfectly emblematic of the challenges of anthology in that it's like it is the highs and the lows for me. There were portions of it that I really loved, and portions of it that I was like, I don't even understand what the hell this page is about. Yeah. So first thing I'll say about this one is that uh, are, are they like trolling us? Because like everyone makes fun of Tom King and Mister Odds for doing these nine panel pages. Oh my god. And the, it's whole the whole story whole is just nine, nine panel yeah. pages. All of it is nine panels except for one big splash, and that's it. Yeah. Um, and I think that they make that work very well at times, especially in, Mr. in Mr. Miracle. Like, there were times when it was utilized exceptionally well. Right. But when it's just page after page of that, it's like, you know, I brought up the fact with um, David post a couple weeks ago that uh, you know one of the advantages of making comic books is you can utilize the actual medium itself to tell the story by using the panels in a way that emphasize things right and this just totally takes that away uh, and just is like watching a very strangely formatted movie because it's in a vertical rectangle. <laughs> And I, I, there were so many times in just what is it, six pages here? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pages. I was so many times when I was confused as to directionality, like what was happening here and there. And yeah. the perspectives were off enough that it was very confusing. Now, the story, the plot of Batman failing to rescue a, a, yeah, we should, we should. Probably, I guess, mentioned what yeah, the, plot the story. Was. The story in this nine issues, like uh, these nine pages, sorry, uh, is a fire in a church and uh, a priest who goes back in to rescue some children. But Batman has saved all of them, 
And Batman comes back in to rescue the priest who, you know, spoiler alert, has basically died in the fire and gives his last few moments of speaking as a way to talk to Bruce. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, you know, the priest had gotten out of the church and saw Batman rushing back in to save children. And he followed Batman in because he, you know, didn't want to leave. He wanted to help Batman save the children. But Batman right. got all the kids out while the priest somehow got trapped under rubble. Right. Um, and so it starts with Batman, like, coming in and saying, you know, where are you? Where are you? And the priest starts to kind of sing a hymnal, maybe. I don't know what he's singing. but Yeah. Calls but out Batman, as best he can. But Batman finds him. And then when he sees him, he's like, oh, boy, you're way more injured than I expect you to be. So I can't help you right now. I have to leave and get <laughs> stuff to, like, get you out of here. And the priest yeah. is like, nah, dude, like, I'm definitely on my last breath. Just stay with me. I don't want to be left alone in the dark. And I will say the basic plot was is beautiful. perfect for an anthology. Yeah. It's beautiful. And the art is actually really nicely rendered. Each of the panels is really pretty. But I'm fully with you. The layout and the perspective on, on the panels is it takes away a ton from the story. Um, and then... Uh, the, the kind of the payoff for the story was where this one kind of lost me, where he talks about um, the story from the Bible where this judge won't hear people and basically gets sick of listening to them. So he just gives them what they want. And it's supposed to be um, kind of like uh, a biblical big, version of you can't always get yeah. what you want. But the priest is saying like, oh, it's meant to be like God being sick of hearing prayers. But then he says, I realize that it's not about God not wanting to hear the prayers and not wanting to answer them. It's that for every prayer, that means God has failed the person somehow and that they, so it, it you know, upsets God because he has not done his job. Hmm. I don't know. That kind of, yeah. I, I no. felt like there, there could have been a nicer lesson for, yeah, for that, him to impart or like a more em emotional punch. And then, um, was it the end of this one? That really I mean, so I was really looking forward to the Mitch Jared's Tom King story here, and it was something of a letdown. I will, I mean, and that and that was disappointing. Yeah, but the, I, I I'm happy to look and to look it over. It's really beautiful, and the splash page is powerful with the burning cross and everything. But it's very over the top. Yeah. So do you want to do you want to kind of rate each one of them, or should we just? I mean, that story, I would probably give a six and a half. Yeah, I'm at a six. There you go. So look, we're near each other. Um, but mostly for me, it's just I like the I like the, the costume that Bat, that Batman sports in this Mitch Jarrett's one. It feels like a throwback to almost like Golden Age Batman. Yeah. And sure. that was easily the part I dug the most, was seeing him in that in that old school costume. I don't know how else to describe it except like retro golden age style. Um, it, it looked much more like, here, let me make you do this. Um, yeah, it looked much more like uh, just kind of a cloth costume rather than a yeah, big yeah. armored. That's a good way to describe Christopher it. Christopher Nolan body armor suit. It's just like a that's cloth fine, cape but... that's over his shoulders. I don't seem to be able to get the focus to do what I want, but um, sorry. Uh, so epic fail on my part, but there, yeah. So I dig the 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 look of it. Yeah, Todd Christian says King's story reminded me of Venom from Legend of the Dark Knight, where Batman couldn't save the little girl from drowning. Yeah, that's a great little. Ooh, that's yeah. a great uh, great parallel. Great story arc there. Yeah, he gets on the he gets on the juice. The, the Venom cool. juice that was being. Those were like hot books back in the day. Man, looks like he reminded me of, uh, was it Ben Affleck when he did his HBO special on Roid Rage? <laughs> um, so the next one is by Sophie Campbell. And I will say I dig her style and the look is so different from the Mitch Jarrods one. It's strong. Con you were talking about contrasts. Yeah. Strong contrasts. And Almost no background on some of them, you know, like it's just all white 
background, very dark costume. And the, the use of the white and black, not only just stylistically interesting, but plot wise yes. plays in. So there are two stories in this book that I felt. So something I was thinking about while reading this is that if you are doing a Batman black and white story, there should be a reason you're doing it in black and white. Now it doesn't have to be story related like it happens to be in this case, but it should at least be stylistically because mo like as nice as the Mitch Gerrard's one looked, if you threw color over that, it would probably just improve it. That's fair. Like there, there was nothing about it that said, I'm using black and white for the sake of using black and white. It's right. that it felt just like I'm doing this. It's a black and white story. I'm just not going to add color where I feel like Sophie Campbell's was much more intentional in how she used black and white as black and white. And, right. you know, especially considering that it is a story point as well. So the Sophie Campbell one focuses on Batman and Catwoman early in their relationship. And there's, uh, there's the no, no text in this one either. Yeah. It's a, it's about the back and forth of her stealing things, him trying to catch her and her coming up with ways to outwit him, including in this particular story arc, her realizing that perhaps a costume that would ma better match a snowy Gotham being the decision du jour. So she, she creates a white Catwoman costume that allows her to more blend in with her surroundings and play a better cat and mouse, cat and bat sort of thing. Yeah, she sees a white cat that kind of blends into the snow and then she, uh, so she sews up a little white suit yeah, and then next time Batman's chasing her, you can see her here. You can see her little mouth and ears hiding in the snow. Yeah, I love my favorite one is then actually the very next panel where she's like, "You've got Batman and and the snowflakes in front of him, and her with the snow almost behind her." I love it. I love that. Yeah. Up here, at the top that one. Yeah, that one's my favorite. So uh, good night, TJ. Sorry if uh, if you're not feeling well or if you're just uh, exhausted. I know it's super late. Um, yeah, thanks for stopping by, TJ. Uh, Chaos and Comics, what's up? Nice to see you. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, especially right after the Tom King story, which was very heavy. This is very light. Yeah, um, and you know, kind of silly and funny, but like it still was amusing. Totally. And um, the, the use of the black and white, like I said, was really, to me, the selling point for this one. So this one gets like a nine. I was going to say a nine for me as well. Like it, it, it was my, spoiler, second favorite one. And um, I really got a lot of excitement out of that one. And I thought, okay, that was the palate cleanser that I needed. Like, let's just, let's, Forget that other story. Let's just keep going. Sadly, uh, it didn't work out that way. No. <laughs> so the next one, um, the next some, one is, is by uh, <coughs> Gabriel Hardman and Corina yeah. Bechko. And uh, this one I felt like was a story mess to me. And might have been my least favorite. I got to double check on the next one. Yeah, it was probably my least favorite. Oh, boy, really? I got some stuff to say about <laughs> the next one. I mean, tomato, tomato at this point. but it. Uh, so I'll show you what this one looks like. Yeah. It had it had some cool stuff with the art. Um, the art looks, I think it's, it's the most detailed of any of them. Yeah, but at the same um, time, again, like, look at this page. It just looks like. It's there's so much going on, and right. you know, again, I'm not the best person to say, you know, judge that because I like simpler, more clean things. But you know, for what it is, it was done pretty well. So basically, the story is that an EMP goes off in Gotham, which makes Batman's car die in the middle of driving at the Batmobile, and he crashes into um, kind of like a runoff river thing. Still way, yeah. Uh, 
when he's trapped kind of underneath the car and he tries to get out with his uh grappling, grappling hook bar. yeah which very fortuitously for the joker he's right there this was my least favorite part because he launches it like all the way up the ravine and then the suddenly the joker joker kicks it joker kicks it off and then is all of a sudden right on top of the batmobile yeah. talking which is the like, page i showed that jump that jump was bug yeah, not not crap. ideal oh my uh, god and so joker is basically like oh i didn't do this uh he calls it calls an, an emp so sterile it's not his style um so he says but you know when i found out this happened and i i guess figured or saw that batman i wasn't clear about that that batman drove off the road he's like oh i couldn't wait to come and watch you die um and batman's like no that wall is gonna break like you have to help me help you so we can both get out of here alive um And then I think I, for me, the biggest frustration with this story is that it missed out on the opportunity to really have a Batman Joker conversation amidst a yes. city in chaos. Yes, where and Joker where Joker has him like literally pinned where he can't escape. He's a he is a uh, you know a, a bat in a cage. Yeah, if to say so. and, and, it, and it could have it could have been and I think I, my writing teacher would have said that this person had a chance to do a really great character piece and they chose to make it about plot, which is stupid writing when you're only covering like four pages, five pages in a book to make it all plot is a big waste of your time when you could make a character and make it so much more. If it had been character driven, Joker just would have played with him and it would have been this discussion and you know, you'd have the water slowly rising and the city working on getting its power back and Batman being stuck and trying to figure out how to get out and just this conversation. Yeah, so I think all that. I think all of the pieces are in there. They're just not done right. Yeah. And so the thing about the 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 dam about to break, instead of Batman saying, Hey, that's about to break. Batman should realize that and use it to his advantage to know that he's going to get his chance to escape and best the Joker. Right. And it should then, be like a ticking. It should be the ticking clock, right? The the time bomb that we're waiting to go off. Where you, where you keep seeing the thing crack a little more and crack a little more. Oh, Joker rising, right? Yeah. And then here is the second biggest problem with this for me, where this should have been the for me the theme of the conversation. But instead, Joker just says it, and in saying it, A, ruins the impact of the conversation they could have had, and B, totally breaks the fourth wall, where Joker says, you know, I've about had it with this whole two sides of a same coin, yin and yang, 1950s pop Freudian take on our relationship. There's no mystical connection between us. Yeah, like you can't be aware of what the comic is set, like what comics have been saying about these characters. Like, I guess maybe the newspapers in Gotham would say that, but it's a bit of a leap. So Joker is self-aware of yeah. his fictional character in that moment, which really took me out of it. But if they had had a conversation that hinted at that, Maybe it would have been a little stronger. So I will, it reminds me of uh, the movie Soap Dish when the director of the soap opera says, uh, "We're making a statement here, people, but let's not underline the statement. Let's just make it." Yeah, <laughs> like, and this this definitely felt like they were just like, "Let's make the statement. Let's just make a statement instead of just telling the story." And it for me, it points out why I hate Joker as a villain because it's just always so on the nose. And and it 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 always it feels like it's so rare that a Joker story adds some level of value or depth to the Batman mythos. It's always just from it feels like a money grab. Let's just throw Joker in and make some money. Yeah. Um I yeah, I think when Joker is done very well, he is the best villain in comics. But oftentimes I agree he is not done very well um for me one of my favorite joker stories is just like a single issue of a i think it's a detective comics issue from like the early 2000s late 90s where 
the story is of Batman trying to find this little girl that Joker had kidnapped. And it's being told, if I remember correctly, fr like from the point of view of a conversation between them after the fact. But you're seeing Batman trying to find this little girl, but it, all the narration is after when he's hmm. kind of tracked the Joker back down. And the whole thing turns out to be that Joker put this little girl in the trunk of a car with an oxygen mask. And Batman, the, the, the payoff is basically Batman saying, um, you know, why did you do this? Why did you go to the trouble of kidnapping her just to uh, keep her alive? Like you knew she wasn't going to die. And he said, because you go into every situation assuming the victim is already dead and you can't do that anymore. <laughs> And for me, that's like what the Joker should be. He should be a Joker. He should be someone who messes with Batman. Who the, kind of the, like the anarchy of it all. Right. Who kind of like pulls at his strings and like, you know, screws with him. Right. Instead Absolutely. of just being this grand citywide anarchist. But hmm. uh, so then we get to the last page. So the dam does break, like Batman says, and Batman was, is able to free himself and save the Joker. Uh, and then it ends with just the biggest kick in the ass. So B Batman says, uh, uh, Joker says, cough, cough, you owe me as he's pulling him out of the water. And Batman says, what? I saved your life. And B Joker says, you owe me getting to watch you die. That is just, it, it is a huge swing and a miss for me. Yeah. Again, I think that it's just that story was way too on the nose and could have been a very great character piece. And it became, let's just do plot. And I think that that was a, I think in an anthology, it's always, that's always a mistake. If a writer is not doing character in a, in a, in a three, six page story, then they're they're going in the wrong direction. This isn't this isn't an ongoing like I've got to write a six issue story arc and I got to keep the plot going. This is a you have six pages, focus on character, make us care. I, I would tend to agree, and I tend to enjoy character pieces more in general. However, uh, I'm going to counterpoint you because I'm guessing your favorite story is the last one, which is very much plot driven. It is very much plot driven, but I I love I love that last story a lot. I mean, I will say I'm, I I put it on par with with Sophie Campbell's. I don't know that I would say that it's necessarily. I said uh, yeah, I think I'd say it's better. I would be willing to say it's better. But uh, I just not, love, I love the format of that one. No, yeah, it's, it's one. yeah. Uh, okay. So the so next I'll, one, sorry, do you want to grade that last one or just want to move? Yeah, on? it's like a, I mean, the art is cool. I'll give it like a three. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably give it a five. I don't know, somewhere in there. It fails. It's failing for sure. Yeah, it is um, not, not ideal. The next one's called Batman Duel, and it's by Dustin Weaver, who I have no knowledge of, but apparently he's worked with um, Wildstorm uh, Studios, sorry, and um, done Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. So... Uh, he does have an interesting art style, and there are some portions I like, but it does remind me of TMN, like bad TMNT, mm. um, where things don't necessarily – it's hard to read the story panel to panel, and some pages are just beautiful to look at, but, but don't, they don't offer really. much. Um, so, like, the ones I – I mean, I love the second panel a bunch where we see Bruce in the cockpit of the plane. Oh, sorry, where's that one? I like that. It reminds me a lot of Dark Knight, like Mil Miller, Dark Knight yeah. stuff. And so the panels I love are the tiny ones. I love this one where it's like a ghostly cape over the city. But then you get this kind of this splash. This is boring. This Batman pose is just kind of boring. Hello, Patrick Wall. How you doing? Um, so this is the fourth story here in uh, Batman Black and white too. Uh, the plot centers around Batman chasing his twin around Gotham, both of them flying bat jets. And the twin is all white 
the white jet and yeah, the white it. The, the black and white Batman. Deep. Yeah, um, bit on, bit on the and they chase each other in and around Gotham, and there's a weird synchronicity to kind of their movements and the way they fight each other. And Batman sort of realizes there's a third party involved in what's happening or what he's seeing. And I'm supremely still confused as to the plot because it seems like he realizes when he shoots at the white Batman, he fires on himself. Yeah, so first of all, uh, th there's this just very convoluted conversation between him and Alfred uh, where he finds this clue, which is a card at one of the scenes. So basically this, this anti-Batman, this white Batman is fighting crime for lack of a better term, but has is doing it in like a very evil way where he's killing criminals, petty criminals and throwing homeless people in the cage of the lions at the zoo and all this stuff. So he's doing what Batman does, but in a way that Batman would never do it, I guess. Okay. Right. Would you say? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's definitely like murder and, and such involved. <laughs> and so Batman finds this, this card, which is right there at one of the scenes of a crime, which is a white bat painted on a white card. And Alfred finds out that it's basically like the, the white paint is removable and it is uh, a, a business card from someone named Ewan Bryce. And, the, and Alfred says, and the business he belonged to is Wayne Co. And then Batman's response is, Wayne Co., that, it, that is old. The company hasn't, hasn't used that name since before I was born. Like, who, who talks like that? Come on, bro. But uh, so basically that, that's a big mystery. And he has access to Batman's bank accounts and all this stuff. So yeah, then he shoots on him. And uh, he, he like, shoots. Oh. And when Batman fires, he is also hit from behind. And he can't figure out what's going on and basically flies right back past the white Batman and realizes there was another ship. Yeah, massive. A massive ship. giant ship in the background. And uh, both he and the white Batman crash. And it seems like the white bat is dead. Batman somehow uses the 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 opportunity to get aboard the larger craft and finds the command console or the command center of which this is ship. which is very similar to a bat cave instead of a giant t-rex has a giant pterodactyl instead of a giant penny it's got like an illuminati coin yeah so it's kind of like an alternate universe bat yeah. cave almost and turns out, spoiler, the person operating the ship is a very old Thomas Wayne. It says, welcome home, son. And it says, Finnis. Very, I, very European. Which I almost thought it said penis at first. Hey, that would have been a fun twist. Uh, so, yeah, it is practically unintelligible. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to get it. No, I, I, I'm still confused. I don't know that but I fully... I've read it twice, and I don't know that I fully understand it. Here is uh, my biggest problem with it, and this is... Uh, I don't know if this is really a rule, per se, of writing, but it is something that I find myself to be something that works or doesn't work, where if you have narration, especially in something like a comic book or a novel, if it is in first-person... And it, it is like present tense first person. You can get away with whatever you want because you're following the character's thoughts. Okay. If it's in first person, um, but it is in the past tense, for me, you have to answer the question of who is this character telling the story to? Because... Why would a character? Why would you be able to follow a character's thoughts, telling a story, if they aren't recounting it to somebody for a reason? And who would Batman be telling the story to? Very interesting. 
I didn't even get that deep into the narration because I was just trying to pick up the plot compl- as best I could. And I was like, I this is just all over the map. And it's, so unresolved, like right. nothing is nothing is put together to match anything or and add up to anything. When I flipped the page and I saw the Thomas Wayne panel, I was like, oh, he's recounting the story to his dad. But they don't establish that. No, they don't. It's just done. Yeah. So uh, I think for me, that really, really cut it um, off at the knees for me. And again, I don't know if that's a real rule or not, but it, yeah, it, that, always, it always is something that I that takes me out of stories if they're in past tense, first person, where uh, th- there has to be a reason this character is recounting the story, at least. Absolutely. So yeah, maybe I would grade this one a little harsher than I thought. Maybe this one would be a four for me. I just uh, it just doesn't add up to anything, and I don't understand it or care to dive deeper into it. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's kind of on par with that other last one where uh, it looks really cool at times. Um, it has some things that are cool about it, but it was. Uh, I had a hard time following it. And even when I didn't have a hard time following it, I was kind of bored by it. So it, it just didn't cut, cut it for me. But I guess I have to rate it a little bit higher because it didn't make me as mad as the other one. <laughs> uh, which brings us to our final uh, story, the uh, David Asia or uh or Aja, or Aha, or Aya, or I don't know. If someone knows how to say it, let me know. Which has, I, sorry, Todd, I didn't mention that he was mentioning that uh, David Weaver is very talented. He worked on S.H.I.E.L.D. with Jonathan Hickman. Sorry, yeah. I forgot to mention that. Um, so this last one, uh, I will say I was completely won over by the format. It's yes. done like... Super high concept. It's done in the style of old superhero comic strips which i used to read the spider-man ones yeah in the newspaper <laughs> as a kid which i actually had a funny thought about this where if it were actually like those the first two panels of every strip should have been a recounting of the last one but Absolutely. obviously since it's just for the sake of the the format yeah you know he just made it continuous but yeah absolutely and they were always very soap opera uh yeah and this is obviously not. Um, and I, I even liked how he, on the ones that were on Saturday, at the end, it said like, see you, ne- uh, like see you Monday. Yeah. Because there's no Sunday one, right? Yeah. So they are, it's all sideways. Um, the perspective has shifted sideways. They include a date. Yeah. In- which, which, until, which until I realized what was happening with the format, I was like, oh, how annoying that I have to read a sideways comic because it's just a it's just a hassle to turn a comic and read it that way. But so it always this- says the Batman, the name of the story arc, and then the date that the book the, the strip yeah. would have been in the newspaper. Um, I dig it. Um, it's a very another like eh, golden agey Batman mm-hmm. year one kind of thing. And again, much like the Sophie Campbell one, and of course, because he is, for me, an absolutely top tier artist, utilized black and white for the sake of black and white in this very well. There's a lot of panels where it feels like um, he's used that negative space really well, whether it's the bat symbol, like shining so brightly, you don't need the top portion of the symbol, the signal, or this little shot of him, the throwaway of him in a doorway with a ton of just like blank around like in the black here yeah. right behind him. And the, the thing I love that he does really well is that especially like it, in that panel, Batman in the doorway, the light cast on his face is actually um, there, there is no line on that side of his head, but you still, your eye still sees the shape as the shape of his head. If you like squint, if you squint and look at that as just a black shape, it right. doesn't look like a person. But when you look at it, it's just, it's so, just so well done. 
So this is a murder mystery. This story centers around a murder, uh, a cult organization in the background, and Batman still untrusting of the police, a Captain Gordon and a and a, a commissioner that we have uh, in the background of our story that we don't really eh, meet uh, until the end. And uh, Batman trying to solve this case with little help from the Gotham PD. And which the, this case, which includes beheadings and uh, yeah, cult rituals. Yeah. So I mean, I, I I really dig this story. I love the you know the jumps to the Batcave and getting to see all the old tech. You know the mic, an actual microscope, uh, the uh, <laughs> the the real to real. Yeah. <laughs> The technology is so old school. I just, I love it. The, the light shining onto the uh, the microscope from up above in the cave somewhere. I, there's so many panels like that. Or right underneath it. This looks like straight out of uh, uh, Capote's true... Uh, in Cold Blood. In Cold Blood, right? The, the, the farmhouse out in the woods or out in the plains somewhere. And yeah, I just love it. The Batmobile, of course, super old kitschy style with yeah. the bat on the front hood. Um, and the police officers with their like, the crooked police officers with their masks, very uh, Watchmen-esque, the TV series Watchmen. Uh, so much of this that I, I got little giggles from. PJ King says, great use of shadows. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it turns out that the, there's a bunch of crooked cops in on this uh, cult Being led like, astray by, uh, by the crooked commissioner. Who believe that they need to uh, do these ritual sacrifices in order to save Gotham, basically. Exactly. But... Um, it, it is like it just shows how much more talented certain people are and how much more thought people are willing to put into things because he took the time to say, okay, what am I going to do with this rather than just tell a story? Let me come up with an idea. And whether you think it's kitschy or you think it's not, or you think it's like, you know, for this, you know, little over the top or whatever. For me, it was like, okay, you're doing something especially creative. You have free reign for eight pages in a Batman book. What are you going to do? And he said, oh, I'm going to make this like an old comic strip because when else am I ever going to get to do that? Um, and then not only did he have this really cool high concept, but he like knocked it out of the park. Totally. So that for me, that was my favorite one. I'd give it a, a nine and a half just because execution was great. The plot was very interesting, and the, you know, I didn't need huge twists, but it had some. And uh, of course, the look and format was uh, top notch. Yeah, it's great. So good. Wor worth the price of admission alone. And for me, it, I, we didn't mention they, they, they usually, they, each issue comes with, uh, you know, some pinups. Stefan Sedgik does, does one at the beginning, which is really beautiful with Harley uh, in front of Arkham. And then there's one at the end by Ramon Villalobos. Uh, looks like a Batman Returns kind of thing. Uh, and then this is highlighting the next issue's stories and styles as well over here on this side um, and i don't recommend recognize many of these artists john ridley olivier coipel tim seeley i think i recognize that name kelly jones bill quiz evely ben gall just one name ben gall yeah. and nick dragota dragota but the art styles look cool so I'm 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 in for more of this. I just uh, it's such a great uh, alternative to typical Batman stuff. Yeah, and I mean the big advantage is that even with the stories that we really didn't like, it's only a couple of pages. Then you're on to the next one that maybe you do like. So, you know, I think it is. Uh, 
Now, I'm not going to say that every comic should be told like this, but it is certainly a nice change of pace and something that I hope, if, even if it's not in a black and white format, that you know publishers kind of take advantage of more to do these sort of shorter anthology style series where these creators can just have free reign with the characters and have, just tell interesting tales. Well, and I will say that- Hey, the, what's up? My buddy, Justin Comic Justin, Talks. Thanks, man. That's awesome. If you don't follow Justin on Instagram, Joe, check him out. He's got some of the best Instagram auctions in town. Oh, and he just dropped a YouTube video the other day. Uh, oh, he, did he? I know he said he was talking about it. He was repairing old, I think it was SNES games. Mm. And he was doing a lot with like Pokemon cartridges and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was an old video game cartridge. He was cleaning it. Uh, it was cool. But what I was I was gonna say, uh, the ratio of success was lower on volume uh, issue two than on volume one. I think if there were five issues or five or six stories in volume one, the ratio was closer to three quarters of them being. Yeah. Good versus two out of five, I think we scored on this one. Sure. And I mean, you're going to run into that, you know, regardless. Like, you're going to have some that are have a higher chance of success and some, but at the end, hopefully it evens out to, um, you know, pretty, pretty even trade where you're getting hopefully more good stories than bad. Ex yeah, exactly. For sure. Um, yeah. So that's about it for this week, unless you had anything else you want to touch on with other books you might have picked up. Um, I mean, I, I, this was a, I, I, I mentioned before we went live, uh, Last God, final issue. So this was a, a sad, but also really pleasant uh, end to Last God. It's sad in the sense that I'm not going to get any more. And the state of DC nowadays, I'm pretty much assuming I'm never going to get another volume in this. Um, but I, it was a great end to that. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, was there anything else big? I read DC's Dead Planet issue seven, and I'm ready to crap on that at some point. <laughs> Can't wait. Locked and loaded. Uh, all right. Well, in that case, what else you got going on this week? Uh, I'm dropping my pull list video tomorrow, and it's probably the longest video I've done in that series. It's 17 minutes long because I think I'm getting 15 books next week. Like there's a ton of stuff next week. Um, and if you want, I can go grab the clipboard and read through it all, but there's a ton of stuff. Yeah, no spoilers. Uh, we'll wait to see there, are, there are a bunch of fun indie number ones. I think image has got a number one that sounded interesting to me. Uh, boom. I think boom studios had a number one that sounded interesting to me. Uh, crap on it, crap on it, do it. Justin wants to hear your some of your dumps on DCs. I mean, I've 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 bitched about it from the beginning that I think it is an underwritten book that Tom Taylor wanted it to be DC's horror, like a horror movie done by in the DC universe, and he's intentionally made it like a shitty horror movie where people do shitty, stupid things where you're like, why is she running back into the house? Like, why is she doing this? Right. Mm -hmm. Where but, the, 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 the decision making of the characters does not make sense. And, and, and when you do that with, you know, intelligent characters in the DC universe that you love, you're like, okay, well, why are you making Hal Jordan seem like a moron? Like why, why are we making this great DC character? I love the schmuck. Yeah, and for I, me, I, it was, leave that to Guy Gardner. Am I right? Right, he he does it naturally. <laughs> like for me, it was Cyborg and Volume One. Cyborg was like, let's make him just the idiot. Yeah, who who captures Wonder Woman as a zombie? Captures her, knows that it's freaking Wonder Woman as a zombie, and then just turns her back on her and lets her go. Yeah, I wonder what's going to happen to me while I look up at the sky. And zombie Wonder Woman is now set free right behind me. I wonder what's going to happen to me. Who knows? She's a zombie. She only, couldn't do anything. Only, only Cyborg pulls that move. Um, John, you are putting up my type on N numbers next week. Yeah, I'm. I'm putting. Those are your type of numbers. Absolutely. Like I'm not usually. I was down to four books one week not too long ago, but now I'm like twelve this week and four, 15 next week. This is the only thing I bought this week. You're doing good work over there. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, there's some good indies. I think uh, Boom Studios has a book called Luna. 
and Image has a new book, but uh, watch the pull list tomorrow at uh, 6.45 Eastern. I'll break it all down for you, and uh, you can check it all out. Yeah, and before and after, we got some uh, good shows, too, from our buddies tomorrow night. Yeah, it's Tag, tag Team Thursday. It goes Rod, me, uh, then we got uh, Old Wolf, and then No Good Comics is now joined Tag Team Thursday. We got four people doing back-to-back to back content. Yeah. yeah. And then Bearded Comic Bro and I on uh, Saturday night doing an, our fin- finale of musical movies. So we'll have a little uh, chat on uh, family animated musical movies uh, on Saturday night. Very cool. Um, we have D&D on Sunday. Once again, return. Well, yeah, because the Super Bowl is next week, so this week there's no football. The reason we were off this week is because people wanted to watch the game. <laughs> Which we, we all know Tom Brady's just going to win another Super Bowl because he is the GOAT, so why bother watching? Uh, but yeah, D&D on Sunday. Uh, we got... A Big Will's new character is now part of the crew. We are at Castle, Castle Ravenloft finally, and uh, we had some big revelations at the end of last week's episode. So Royal Rumble is this Sunday. Well, shoot, I guess you'll just have to watch Royal Rumble on the replay because, <laughs> just kidding, watch. You don't have to <laughs> give up the Royal Rumble. Well, just, just watch what you want. Yeah, watch what you want. It's your, it's your life, it's your time. Uh, and honestly, d d is probably more fun than us for us than it is to watch for other people. And then uh, next week, we'll be back here on John's channel with a yet-to-be-announced book. Otherwise, I got nothing really going on during the week. It'll be uh, a t- I'm sure it'll be some kind of an indie. Uh, there's a bunch of good ones, so yeah. Just stay tuned. Go Bucks. So for those of you who don't know, I hail from New England, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, um, and you know, Patriots fan for a really long time. Watched them suck for a really long time and then get to see uh, um, him win you know, quite a few Super Bowls and be very successful for a while. And then I moved down here to Orlando and he came down here to Tampa Bay. And so now I can still root for him because he's still like my home team. So uh, are you talking about my books? Because John also wants to rip into those at some point. So if you want to come on the time we do those, uh, by all means, let me know. Hit me up on Instagram, and we will figure that out for sure. He's probably not going to be on the show. He'll be he'll be in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> if you're lucky. Uh, Celtics Lakers this Saturday night. Hell yeah, go seas. Um, otherwise, yeah, uh, keep on keeping on. I don't know. Why I said that. Nurse said that for my life. Yeah. <laughs> Um, stay safe and uh, never turn your back on the ocean. All right. Bye, guys. Have a great day.